Lou Macari's Red and White Army celebrate a famous victory. It's a win for the fans off the field. The day when the fans, with a little help from the players, persuaded Swindon's directors to change their minds. Hello again to you. Well, tonight, we start by looking back at the remarkable career of Lou Macari and those extraordinary events when he and his assistant manager, Harry Gregg, were sacked in April 1985. In the words of the chairman then, they could not work together. There was a public outcry. Players and fans rallied behind Macari, and just five days after being sacked, he was reinstated. He returned to a hero's welcome. The same month, Macari, a lifelong teetotaler, incidentally, was voted Manager of the Month, one of five such awards he was to win in two years. A year later, he uh, took Swindon to promotion for only the third time in their history, and furthermore, he saw them pick up their first league championship, the fourth division title. And to complete a remarkable story, the following year, Swindon won promotion yet again, earning a place in the second division. Lou, looking back, you must be the only manager, manager of the month one moment and sack the next. I think that's fair to say, Roger. I forgot about that, actually, until you just reminded me just now. Um, I think if you say to someone, someone's going to be sacked one month, and then weeks later, going to be receiving a, a manager of the month award, they would say, you're crackers. Yeah. But uh, that happened to me, and when I look back at all the things that have happened, even since I've been at Swindon, I think they've followed my career all the way through all these... Things have happened to me quite regular through remarkable my career. Remarkable things indeed. More on the Swindon remarkable things later. Let's start at Lou's beginning, his early days at Celtic, where he was used as an out-and-out -out striker, usually wearing the number nine shirt, and had an amazing scoring record there. 32 goals in 56 matches. Ball comes across again, McCary going up. Ball drifting in there. And an on goal! An on goal and a sensation! Neil Dalglish. Beach looking for room to move and get her a thumb pass, which she does, blowing hard across. Goal, a lovely move. McCarry with a chance. And it's there! McCarry scores! Now, please. Bit of a one to Craig. Craig into the middle to Dean. McCarry, McCarry, it was the got it. Craig. Again, the big gaps in the hips defence. Craig squaring it. In comes Conley. What's your main memory from your days in the famous hooped shirts of Celtic, Lou? Oh, well, looking back, Roger, you know, to play for Celtic uh, and to be successful with them. If you're a Celtic supporter, and I was, you know, for years I travelled every week and, and went and supported them. And most of the times, it wasn't good times for Celtic at the time. Rangers were the team. Uh, and I had to suffer year after year watching my, my heroes uh, not winning anything. And I always remembered that, you know, I thought to myself, I'd love to be out there one day, um, play for them if I ever played for them. I'd want to win things and I'd want to give the people who were the supporters, obviously, yeah. the I'd want to give them what we haven't had for years. Because mm. um, I used to see people crying on the terrace and I used to go home crying myself. Mm. And my mm. father at the time he was alive, you know, he used to say to me, well, you know, don't worry about it, good times will come. Um, mm back to Celtic and that was the main aim. I thought I'd love to be part of those uh, mm. good times. I was only a kid at the time and uh, the thought of ever playing for them, you know, I thought, well, it might happen to me and I'd love it to happen. Unfortunately for me, you know, it did and when I went onto the pitch, I used to think, well, we're going to win today because I'm not going to send all those busloads of supporters home crying again. Uh, Lou Macari, a man with a passionate feeling for the supporters. That's coming out, isn't it? More on that later and from one of the biggest clubs in Scotland, Lou moved on after five seasons with Celtic joining one of the most glamorous outfits anywhere in the world of football, Manchester United. And uh, over the next 10 years, he became one of the biggest favourites Old Trafford has ever seen. Nicole, the keeper's punch is effective again. Ajax screaming out, but no offside. Hill, well stopped by the goalkeeper, but the parry! carved out so few clear openings this afternoon, Manchester United, but uh, they're still in this one goal down, and here's McElroy with a chance, maybe, and a goal by McCurry. Aiming for Koppel. Touch for Thomas. Looks useful. That's the goal from McCurry, 1-1.
Greenoff does well, but it's Macario punching it forward. And Macario's got the turn of speed and a chance to score here. Good effort. It's there. A great goal by Macari. Touched forward by the number four, Greenoff. Controls it well with his chest. Macario punts a long one forward. And Macari really shows his speed. Keelan came and a beautifully judged love by Macari. Doesn't seem so long ago that uh, Tommy Doherty, wasn't it, went up to buy you for Manchester United? Uh, yeah, I was on my way to Liverpool. Um, I went down there, watched them play, and Bill Shankly took me into the office at the end of the game. <laughs> Very persuasive character, as you know. <laughs> um, more or less forced me to sign. Yeah, yeah. Um, threatened me almost. Yeah. I think because he'd done that, I think that's the reason I didn't sign. Yeah. I went away, I went back to the hotel that night, and I thought, well, you know. I'm not going to have anyone holding a, a gun at my head. Now, we've mentioned three Scots there. Lou Macari, Bill Shankly, Tommy Doherty. Why do all these Scots make such damn good managers in England? Um, well, that's, that's your opinion, <laughs> Roger. I think, it, I think it's a desire to win. Um, desire to win? Yeah. I think if you're not with that desire to win and you can't um, generate that through to the players, I think you can forget about it. Yeah. And I think Bill Shankly, I think if you speak to any Liverpool player, it was fortunate enough to uh, play there while he was manager. They'll tell you that uh, his life depended upon it. Yeah, well, Bill Shankly, when asked if football was a matter of life and death, said, no, it's more serious than that. Well, a little earlier, we uh, saw Lou scoring, didn't we, in a Scottish Cup final, but uh, he also was to score a vital goal in an FA Cup final at Wembley. Or did he? Well, judge for yourselves as we look back now at the 1977 final. It's Liverpool going for the magic treble of League Championship, European Cup and FA Cup. with a header, Keegan with a header, off McElroy, oh and Pearson, put through by Greenoff, Jones is after it, Pearson shot, go! I don't think Ray Clemens would be too pleased at this one, because it sneaked in between him and the near post, in fact, the one very reminiscent of a good Liverpool score against Newcastle, against Arsenal, I think. Now it's McDermott, and instead of the treble, can it possibly be trouble? Highway. McDermott back for Joey Jones. Too high for Keegan, but Case is there. The shot by Case to go! 1 1. What an answer. Stephanie prostrate. Liverpool celebrate. And Jimmy Case, who's had a fantastic scoring record over the last month, gives the best possible reply. What a turn by him, Jack. Beautiful turn, and what a volley. Just coming off the ground, caught it beautifully. Roy to Nickel. And now to Koppel. Hughes with the leap, but he's beaten in the air. Greenoff trying to get in behind Tommy Smith and might succeed in doing so. And the ball's in the net. And it's got to be down to Jimmy Greenoff, although Macari and Hill are there to claim it too. Now oh, that's an incredible turnabout. And it'll take the slow motion to sort that one out, Jack. Greenoff right in there, fighting and tussling, and in the end winning. And there's the shot. And it's 2-1 to Manchester United. I think that took a little bit of a defection, Brian. The shot from Macari. Yes, it did. It did indeed. Hit Greenoff. And I think Macari will claim it. Liverpool 1, Manchester United 2. for the second successive cup final. David McCreary, the man who took his place. Steve Koppel, a kiss for that medal. Lou McCarry, Jimmy Greenhoff. Well, was it your goal or Brian Greenhoff's? Well, you know it wasn't mine, Roger. <laughs> That's one time I wish television wasn't there uh, and I would have claimed it. 
But no, uh, the first ball up, um, Emlyn Hughes jumped for the ball and I was alongside him and flicked on to Jimmy Greenough and I made my way back into the box to hope the ball would drop down. And fortunately enough for me, it did. Um, and struck it. And like anything, it happened so quick. Um, your only concern is the ball's in the back of the yeah. net. And at the time, I thought I'd possibly just clipped a Liverpool player who was challenging Jimmy Greenough. But then I remember I was in the dressing room after the game. Um, and at the time, in the FA Cup final, if you scored the winning goal, you received a golden boot. Mm. And I was thinking, God, I hope I get that golden boot. Mm. Um, it was, I think about 30 seconds later, Jimmy Greenough walked in with the golden boot under his arm. <laughs> <laughs> so I then knew I hadn't scored it, which was a big disappointment, believe it or not, because... Uh, you know, those mementos. Yeah, well, I tell you, looking at those pictures again, I'd have given it to you. It was your shot, clipped him and went in. However, that's history now. I tell you one thing, uh, you didn't always win at Wembley, though, did you? It was a disappointing place for you occasionally. Um, yeah, funny enough, uh, different to the Liverpool match there. I'd been there the previous season when we were playing Southampton. In the cup final. In yeah. the cup final. And I remember uh, going down Wembley Way, and as you can imagine, on the day, Wembley Way was packed um, with the vast majority of Man United supporters. Yeah. I would have said 80,000 to 220,000 Southampton supporters. Mm. And I remember going down there and I was so nervous before the game. Um, I couldn't believe it because I thought, God, if we would lose here today. Yes, you were 80, outstanding favourites anyway, yeah. Uh, outstanding favourites. And again, the thought of disappointment to the majority. Yeah. Um, and of course that came, came about. We lost 1-0. Yeah. Indeed, one of the great upsets, Lou, of football. So, but then you were to go on and win at Wembley. And that was nice for you. And apart from Celtic and Manchester United, of course, you also had a very distinguished international career, winning 24 full caps for Scotland. Uh, now, we Englishmen don't much like looking back to 1977. We didn't have too much pleasure then. Scotland came to Wembley looking to win the home championship for the second successive year. And there's Ray Clarks. Now, he knows he's going to be under a bit of pressure now. Now, can Scotland, just before half-time, Nick something here. They all went in there. But, well, it's in there. Whether it was McQueen, I think, who put it there. One nil to Scotland. Gordon McQueen. Here's the floated free kick from Asa Hartford. McQueen jumping well with Riok. Yes, McQueen's header. Wide of Ray Clements, and Scotland are in the lead. If he were to make another substitution now, would you? Uh, who would you fancy? Well, before making the substitution, I, I would prefer to see one of the de defenders free themselves from uh, a Scottish player. Here's Johnston. There's a goodish cross there towards Bruce Rioch. Not in again towards Bakari. Oh, and Dalglish. And it's there, number two, Kenny Dalglish. Look at Ali McLeod. Did you see him there? There's the cross by Willie Johnston. And there's Rioch. The back heel by Macari. There's Kenny Dalgleish. Macari going for it, but it's Dalgleish who forces it over. Touch there by Pearson for Francis, and this time it's a penalty for England. That looked a bit on the hard side, I must say. But it's a penalty. Well, here's Mike Shannon against Alan Ruff. And that's 2-1. Congratulations to Scotland, well played, and uh, there must be chances for their progress in the World Cup competition. They've come, they've seen, and they've conquered, and they've broken up the place as well. Well, the words of Sir Ralph Ramsey there, I should say nothing about your supporters there taking bits of Wembley home, Lou. Most upsetting. Uh, not only beating us, but taking the stadium away as well. Uh, but Sir Ralph Ramsey there saying Scotland should do well in that 1978 <laughs> World Cup down Argentina way. It didn't work out that way, no, did it? Not the best of tips to Sir Ralph, is he? <laughs> uh, no, just Argentina was a disaster for us. Um, looking back, Ali, the manager at the time, Alan McLeod, not only did he put a lot of pressure on us as a team, but he yeah. put a lot of pressure on himself. By saying you were going to do well, yeah. Well, he didn't exactly say that. He said, we're going to win the World <laughs> Cup. You know, he, he told everyone in Scotland to wait till, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it was July 31st, and yeah. be at Glasgow Airport. Yeah. And we'd be you still had the celebration before you left, didn't well, you? Well, he did, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. you know, it's just a matter of time before uh, that little nation north of the border would come back with the World Cup, yeah. which, uh, as you know, Rogers, ludicrous. Yes. Yeah. Well, we went to Argentina and, <coughs> excuse me, um, 
a little bit like England in the European Championships. As a matter of fact, it was a carbon copy of it. Mm. Everything went wrong. Uh, and when everything went wrong, television and press started getting on the players' backs and the managers' back, and it went from bad to worse. Lou, tell me something, because you're a Scottish international and you know a lot about the game as player and manager. Everyone says the Scots have got so many good players, should have a better international record. Now, should they? Um, with the players over the years that they've had, I'm not saying now they should have a better team. Um, but over the years? Over the years, well, you've seen some of the clips yeah. of films. Yeah. People you forget, even yeah. I forget, and I played yeah. with them. Yeah. Uh, you know, there was Doug Leach, McQueen, yeah. Ryuk, uh, Don Masson. Yeah. People like that you forget that you, you played with all those players, and there's, and there's a lot of them, you know, a lot of good players. So in the past, we should possibly have had a, a better team than, than we've had. Better results, yeah. Better results, but we've always had a self-destruct button, haven't we? Self-destruct button. Well, there you are, folks. Uh, clearly uh, a playing career, though, uh, by Lou Macari, spent at the very top. Celtic, Manchester United, Scotland. But in the summer of 1984, Lou took what many folk thought was a huge gamble. He dropped right down into the basement of the English League as player manager of a club in the fourth division. Appointed as assistant, he appointed as assistant manager Harry Gregg, did Lou, the former Manchester United goalkeeper and a survivor of that uh, Munich air crash. Well, it should have given Lou support off the field whilst he continued to play. Swindon's main sponsors had demanded a top-name player manager, and in Macari, uh, they soon found they'd made a popular and effective choice in that way. But it was off the field that Macari began to have his biggest effect on Swindon. He demanded a level of physical fitness the players had never experienced before. But behind the scenes, the macari harry Gregg partnership was breaking down, and the board decided to what sack them I've both? Three lads who have been sort of fanatical Manchester United supporters, and we've come here, and it's fair to say in nine months the the fanatical Swindon Town supporters. Um, I didn't know how to approach it, but you know, telling them that uh, their dad was no longer the manager of Swindon or a player for Swindon, um, and it took a lot of courage for me to go in and and tell them that. Now I was I was expecting a reaction, and really I didn't get one. And when I left the room, I started crying, and I expected them to do that. Well, Swindon's fans were furious at the way the directors had sacked the player manager they had idolised. Uh, and the Swindon players made it known that they too supported Macari and wanted him back. It was an astonishing vote of confidence in a man who'd been with the club less than nine months. But the fans won the day, the directors relented, and five days after being sacked, Lou Macari returned to the county ground. And furthermore, he returned to and a standing ovation. It was a remarkable demonstration by the Swindon fans. Lou, unique scenes in football. Now, you must have a soft spot for those Swindon fans now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's been the biggest problem of my life, really, Roger, because I think like any manager, you're in, you're in the game to progress. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully you do well for the club you're at. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been fortunate that that has happened to me. And I think what we've just seen there has been a reason why I find it a little bit difficult to leave. Yes, um, yes. I probably should have left. People will say, you know... Chelsea was one club that came for you, yeah. Uh, well, there's been a few clubs that I think most managers in football will say, well, I'm off, I'm going. Yeah. So that was great for me. Um, my main aim, I think, at the time was to go back and do a job and do it well. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to win uh, a bit like my playing career. I don't know why people wanted me back, because as, as you said in the, the clip there, I'd only been there nine months, or less than nine months. Oh, think. Well, you've done well there, haven't you? Well, nothing had happened, and I couldn't think, you know, I thought, well, what do these people want me back for? There's no sign that uh, Swindon Town are going to do anything. Um, and they had more faith in, in my ability than I had I think you had already communicated this passion you have for the supporters. And after all, Lou, you, you've made it very clear. You know they are the most important people in football. Without them, the professional game can't exist. And the Swindon fans were rewarded for their faith in you as manager the following season. Swindon clinched promotion to the third division on April 8th. With another seven matches still left to play, they were already there. They went up with a 4-2 win over promotion rivals Chester City, watched by a crowd of 12,600, their biggest of the season. Yes, Swindon were going up in style. 
and the fans, they loved it. They were getting their, re their reward for their faith in Makari. Yes, it had been an amazing season. They'd lost five of their first eight league fixtures that season, but by the end, they'd set an all-time football league points record. They'd won 32 fourth division matches and amassed 102 points. Building up a gap, would you believe, of 18 points above Chester, who were to finish second to them in the table. What a fourth division team that was. Well, even then, the Swindon bubble had not burst. Only one year later, those Wiltshire Moonrakers were at it again. They'd reached the third division playoffs. Then an unknown and experimental new part of the football scene. It was June before the season was to end, and uh, it was to be goals by Steve White that finally made sure it was Swindon who would play in the second division the following season. A huge crowd of fans went to neutral Selhurst Park, Crystal Palace's ground, and they saw Swindon defeat Gillingham 2-0, and there's White's second goal making it. Yes, the Swindon fans knew they were going up again. The fans insisted there's only one Lou Macari. So, young man, promotion back to back. Now, that's got to be a big memory to keep up there. Uh, I think you said something about the bubble bust and. Uh... When we come out of the fourth division, I thought, well, that's great. We've, we've not only done it, we've done it in style. We've got 100 and odd points. Uh, we're now in a higher division, very little money, which is always the case at Swindon. Um, Until you need it. <laughs> well, I think that's where you need a board of directors that are going to back you and say, well, go yeah. on, go and buy somebody. Um, and you, you know, you think, well, the bubble will bust now. You just, if you can hang on in the third division, you, you're doing OK. Yeah. Um, and again, we didn't get away to the best of starts, like you mentioned in the fourth division. Mm. Things just took off. We kept winning, we kept winning. And credit to the players there, we, we, we had a nucleus of players that wanted to win. Um, and if we lost one week, if we lost the next week, they would say, well, let's rectify it the following week. Harking back to your boys, your, your days as a lad watching Celtic, and this desire to win, you communicate that to your Swindon players now, don't you? <coughs> Roger, it's the, it's the greatest asset you can have as a player is to want to win. Forget about all the garbage you talk about, skill and all that. If you want to win, and you want to win badly enough, it will move mountains. And the players we've got, the players we've had, and the players that we'll get in the future will possibly do that. In the clip of film there, Steve White, two goals at uh, Crystal Palace against Gillingham, mm. hadn't been in the team. Just came in and performed as though he'd been in the team all season and got his reward, and obviously that reward he got, not only on the night was it great for him, but an everlasting memory. How do you feel about today's footballer compared to your playing days? It's not in the same league. Not in the same league? <laughs> not in the same league whatsoever. I know when I was playing, I used to listen to players who said players of the past were better. And, and like everybody, you say, well, he's only saying that because he's not a player now. Well, Lou, t time has caught up with us. They may be not as good, but you're driving them at Swindon. They're not doing too bad. It's been fascinating talking to you, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, That's sir. it. Well, we'll be back next week with another flashback for the fans. Yeah, thanks very much. Great.